upon us today. Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to be here this morning and assemble ourselves together to honor your great and holy name. We thank you for the bountiful blessings that you have bestowed upon us in this life and in this world that we live. Fill our hearts with compassion and mercies, Lord, as we look to others who are less fortunate than we are. We're grateful to be able to come together in a, a, a facility as we're able to come here today and, and Lord, just enjoy comfort. There are those who do not have that. And, Lord, we just pray you would bless them as well. And we know your presence is the same, whether it be here or in a different setting. But we pray, O oh Lord, that you would minister mightily to us today as we minister to you in worship and honor and giving praise to your glorious and mighty name. We ask your will to be done in this assembly this morning, and we'll be careful to give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. You that would like, remain standing. If you have a problem standing, you can sit. It's okay. Just worship the Lord with us.
to take my joy away from me. But I've overcome through his blood with Christ alive in me. My heart can every day proclaim I'm overjoyed. Jesus, you center of it all. 
it's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about. Jesus be the center of your church. Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess you, Jesus. 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 talking about a building but the people the hearts and the lives that are drawn together in this in this fellowship and I know that one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess no matter what side we're on but God until that day comes help us to fervently and radically proclaim your name Jesus Ushers have come this morning. We're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. And we are so thankful for your generosity. May God bless you, and he will as you give. And we see this as an opportunity of worship this morning to give as God has blessed us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, Father, for all of your blessings. We thank you, Father, for providing our needs and meeting our needs. And we ask, Father, that you would bless this offering as we freely give back a portion to you this morning. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Lord, I know this firm foundation I stand on. And I know in my times of trouble and in my times of need, you are my Savior. You are my Redeemer. You are my healer. You are. I praise you, God. Lord, bless us this morning. Lord, speak to our hearts. And bring us closer to you. Amen. Amen. He is all those things to all of us this morning, isn't he? And thank, thank, we're so thankful that he is this morning. And 
it helps you get up on Monday morning and face the day knowing that, amen, that we have hope in Jesus this morning. Uh, got several announcements for you this morning. It's going to be a busy couple of months coming up. We know that. It's that time of year. But if you would sign our welcome pad for us, we'd appreciate that. Pass it by. Be on your left, my right of the pew and send it down. We'd appreciate you doing that this morning. Wednesday night, got some new things going on. We go directly to our various uh, classes and departments on Wednesday night. So be here at 630, ready to go. Brother Bell's got a series he's uh, doing with us. It's the Truth Project. And it is phenomenal. If you haven't been able to attend, you're missing out. It'll give you a very good uh, barometer or, or where we're at in this society today and, and some things that we need to do as Christians to be prepared to, uh, to fight that. And uh, we'd like for you to be here. Also, our Northside Rangers started last Wednesday night. We've got a good group of boys, Brother Lyndon, and his, his uh, helpers are, are looking. Well, I think they had about 14 that, that started the first night. We're very excited about that, and I know the guys are too. So just bring your, your son, your nephew, your grandson. We'd love to have them. That starts at pre-K and goes uh, through uh, fifth grade. So if you, you have somebody that fits into that, that age group, please bring them. And our, our girls are meeting also in a, in a separate room, and uh, we're just excited about that. And youth is continuing on with Brother uh, James and Sister Brittany. They're taking over our youth department, and everything is moving forward in our church, and we appreciate that this morning. Also, Brother James has got a request this morning. If anybody has an AV surround sound receiver or stereo speakers that they would like to donate to the youth department, he's looking for one, so let him know. He, he hit the ground running, didn't he? <laughs> That's good. Um, <laughs> And today is the cutoff. If you, uh, we're, we'll be replacing two deacons in, in October and at our annual business meeting, and uh, we need to have those turned in no later than today. If you can, Brother Bill might give you another day on that. I don't know, but but just get with him. If you feel like you're qualified, maybe you don't know. Spend a little time talking to him. He'll answer your questions, and uh, we're looking for qualified people, people that that are willing to serve and be about the business of this church and, and, and listening to God's uh, spirit as he speaks and uh, the direction that he's guiding and, and directing us in. So be praying about that. And uh, it's not just putting your name on the ballot, okay? It, it's uh, We want you to pray about that. We want you to be qualified. We want you to feel like that it's your calling to serve. And we're not trying to, to disqualify anybody or separate anybody. We just, this is important business, okay? And we want someone that is, uh, that's willing and qualified to serve in that office. Also, today at 2 o'clock, Brother Chuck wants to meet with uh, six other guys that are going to Haiti. So uh, uh, are you excited about going? I am. I mean, I'll just tell you, I think about it every day and uh, kind of making some preparations in, in my own life, getting ready to go, and uh, we're excited about that. And I think we're going to see some great things and be involved in some great things and, uh, and be a part of it. That's, that's the main thing. So uh, please be here at 2 o'clock if you're planning to go. And... Uh, Next Sunday, the 15th, our youth department's having a hamburger and hot dog dinner for donations. I told y'all he hit the ground running. And <laughs> um, then the 20th and 21st, Friday, Saturday, our Women of Faith Conference in Orlando. All the tickets have been purchased. They'll be leaving at 9 o'clock on Friday morning and uh, be returning Saturday evening late. That's the only time I got was late. <laughs> so y'all be praying for our ladies that are traveling. And uh, we pray that they would have a wonderful conference and come back energized and ready to go. September the 29th, Sunday morning, be one day to feed the world. Brother Bell and Brother Chuck mentioned that earlier. Very important day in, in America that we have an opportunity to participate in the lives of some children that don't have a full plate of food every day. Not every meal, but every day. And so we want to be a part of that. And uh, do what you can do. It's not to uh, put pressure on anybody or condemn anybody or make you feel guilty, but just do what you can do. God can do more with a dollar than you and I can do with a $1,000. And, uh, but if you can give more, you give more. But that's between you and God, okay? Uh, also, the women's ministry needs donation for slides and activities for our upcoming harvest dinner in November. And uh, we're going to try to do something for our kids, as we always do. So if you'd like to help them with that, see Sister Amanda, and she will apply that where it needs to be. And, uh, and if you'd like to help out, just let her know that. Also, Saturday, September the 28th, guys, from 5.30 to 7.30 at Brother... Uh, Jeff's and Sister Marissa's house be a football uh, football fellowship and, and uh, food. I, I got that in the wrong order. It's food, football, and fellowship. <laughs> we'll get it in, in the right order. But we want you to come. We always have a great time, and uh, Sister Marissa always just gives us her house, and we appreciate that, and she does a great job preparing everything and taking care of it. But, but let Brother Jeff know if you plan to attend, and we would love for you to, to bring your son, bring someone with you. It's a time of fellowship to get to know each other and uh, just enjoy a good afternoon. Amen. Stand with us this morning.
We appreciate you being here. God bless you for being here. And we want to dismiss our children's to children's church this morning and toddler times and shake hands with someone and let them know you're glad to see them at Northside this morning. Amen. We dismiss these kids, don't we? Oh, we still got a good crowd here, though. This is a lot of folk to give account for on Judgment Day, ain't it? Yes, it is. Good to see you. I want to give you an update on some folks before we get into our word today. Uh, for the Haven Birch, uh, he was able to come home. Uh, he don't have a good prognosis from the doctor, but we're going to continue to look to God. He's in good spirits. And uh, he's like I've heard some other folks say, he ain't afraid to go. It's just those things associated with it. That kind of makes you a little bit uneasy sometimes. I uh, want to continue to remember Brother Charles. Brother Charles, he's, he's continuing to improve, doing better. Uh, Sister Faye's having some, still having some problems, and I believe Tuesday's going to uh, see the doctor about her situation, her heart condition. My granddaughter, Sienna, is able to come home. Saw her yesterday. She's just a beautiful little baby doing good. I say baby, she's four years old, but she's back home doing great. We just thank God for the miracle God's working in her life. And Sister Carol, uh, last Sunday, we were just looking for her to go any minute, and uh, I believe it was Sunday, they took the, uh, all the meds off, and, and uh, just she'd been requesting, I'm ready to go home. And so... Uh, they agreed just to take all the medications off and take that magnet, put it over that or whatever that is, and put it over the pacemaker and all just in case her heart, just in case her heart stopped beating, it wouldn't try to keep going. And so uh, she closed her eyes and took a little nap, about 30 minutes. <clears throat> One of Ike's sisters came in, hadn't made it up there yet, and says, 
hey, Carol, everybody's gathered around the bed. They said 30 minutes to an hour would be about the most, you know. And they gathered around the bed watching for her to go. And uh, Carol, uh, Madeline came in and said, hey, Carol. And she opened her eyes, looked around. Everybody kind of jumped back. You know, they was expecting her to just go on to heaven. But she didn't. You know, uh, even though she requested that God would just take her on in, uh, she, God saw fit for her to stay here. So uh, she's still here, got to come home. And uh, our kidneys started back working and uh, other things that needed to start working. So uh, we're, we're just grateful for what God's doing. And Brother Robin's mom, uh, Oreen Chestnut, uh, she's still not out of the woods, needs your prayers. Uh, I want to continue to Brother Ed. He's able to fix him kidneys. He's on dialysis, but God's able to fix it. Uh, I want to continue to them. Remember also uh, Alan Riley. Uh, Sister Pettis' uh, nephew uh, had a serious infection. But we want to just keep these in mind as we pray together and believe God for His great mercies. That's what we're going to be talking about, by the way, today, is God's mercy. I'm so glad for the mercies of God. I want to read a scripture uh, found in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 34. And it begins with this, O give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good, and his, and his mercy endureth forever. I learned a long time ago, I didn't want justice when I stand before God. And anybody that's ever stood before God and stands before God, I believe will say the same thing. Because God is holy. And His holiness is uh, perfect. And mine and your holiness is in Christ. And He is our righteousness. And so we're grateful for the mercies of God. And it's God that provides that. That is uh, His uh, prerogative uh, to give mercy. And I'm certainly glad for it. Ezra, one of his prophets, said in chapter 3 and verse 11, he started out actually in verse 10. They had laid the foundation for the, for the temple of the Lord. And uh, the priests and all had their apparel there and... Uh, their priests, some blowed trumpets, and the sons of Asaph had cymbals, and they were praising the Lord uh, after the ordinance of uh, King David of Israel. And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because He is good and His mercy endureth forever. When we were singing this morning, I don't know, I... I have these thoughts on my mind when I, when I come to church that God's put on mine, the scriptures that He's put on my heart. And when we're singing, it just seems like it just comes alive, uh, the great mercies of God. When we talked about, you know, we're going to sing praises before Him. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the, feather, uh, God the Father. And uh, it's just, just wonderful to experience the great power of God. And then there are times you and I, uh, we, get it, we, we experience certain things on this earth because everything, every day is not pleasant. Uh, if you've lived very long and, uh, at all, you realize there are days that are not pleasant. Now every day we've been instructed by God is a day that God made. And our instructions is to rejoice. We have to remind ourselves sometime on some of those days that uh, don't seem uh, real pleasant to go ahead and just do what God said. And I can promise you, if you'll press through your feelings and, and your situations, and you'll go ahead and you'll just bless the Lord that day, and you'll go ahead and give honor to His name, your day will be better. I'm not saying that everything's going to be fixed at that moment in time, but you will experience the mercy of God, and, and you'll be better. And in Psalms chapter 6, verse 2, uh, he was experiencing weakness. Sometimes we experience that. Uh, sometimes we feel like, you know, we could go bear hunting with a switch. But there are times we don't feel that good. And if we ever encounter a bear, we probably recant from how we feel and deal with reality. <laughs> but there are times when we're weak. And the psalmist said in chapter 9, verse 13, he said, Have mercy. Let me back up. Chapter 6, verse 2. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. Now, some folks don't think you ought to confess anything like that. I don't know why you'd pray about something that wasn't a reality. So there's a reality there's times we're weaker than we are at other times, not only physically, 
But there are times we are also spiritually weaker than we are at other times. And all of those times, we should call on God and we should ask Him for His mercy uh, to be upon us that we can receive strength from above. For it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to get through whatever struggles that we have here on this earth. And we must trust in that and we must continue uh, to look to God for His great mercy. And there are times and, and we experience trouble and if we're not in trouble, we know somebody else it is. And uh, verse 13 of chapter 9, he said again, Have mercy on me, O Lord, and consider my trouble. There are people that don't like me. As a matter of fact, there's people that hate you. And if you don't think there's people that hate you, you're living in fantasy land. If you're a child of God, there's people that don't like you. They'll like you as long as you go along with what they say and how they feel and what they believe. But the very moment you stand firm on a conviction that's based by God's Word and ordained by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, there will be people out there and say that think you're off the deep end. Uh, but they won't, they won't like you. But that's okay. We pray for God's mercy uh, on us and upon those kind of people uh, that are out there in the world. But there are times when you and I experience difficulties in life and, and we have some illustrations. There's a couple I want to read about in the book of Matthew where Jesus was walking down the road and there were some people that heard that He was coming by. Somehow or another, you and I have to get the message out that the Lord is not only with us, but He's with us in a special way when we gather in His house. We've got to get that word out. So that people like blind Bartimaeus, some of you are waiting to see it before you get the word out. But blind Bartimaeus heard about it and heard some things that Jesus was doing and the mighty works that He did and how big God was. We sang about it this morning. How great is our God. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to get a hold of that. Our God is great. And He is a merciful God. The devil will beat you up every day if you'll let him. But our God is a merciful God. We don't have to tolerate that from the powers of darkness. We can live by faith and experience His mercies that are abundant and wonderful. Even in times, some of you are going through some stuff now, and we can be like these two uh, blind men were, rather. We'll get into blind Bartimaeus possibly later. But these two blind men that followed Jesus in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, this is what they were saying. Thou son of David, have mercy on us. They were following Jesus, and they were crying out and and they was having a pleasant walk uh, there. And, and word got out. It kind of upset things a little bit. And, and they began to cry out with a, with a passionate heart because they knew. They believed Jesus was who He said He was. In fact, they confessed that He was the Son of David. He was the one that was prophesied to come. They believed He was who He said He was. And they were calling upon Him. And they were saying, Oh, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus said to the blind man, Believe you that I'm able? They said, We believe. And God had mercy on them. And their eyes were open. Some people don't believe God still does that. They believe those days are over. And you may not have never seen it, but if you've read about it in God word, God's Word, that's just as good as seeing it. It's just as real. When the Holy Spirit takes this gospel and makes it alive to you, it's just as real to me as if I'd have been there and seen it with my own eyes. I think if we can get a hold of it, we can sing, Oh, how great are you, O oh God. We can sing it with passion in our hearts, with joy in our soul. 
I sang it about loud as I could on that front pew there. I almost got hoarse. I said, better back off a little bit. But you know what? I may not get to preach. So I thought if I sing. I know it's hard to hear over these speakers, but I'm going to tell you, folks, God is great and He's mighty and His mercy endures forever. I don't go to God because, because I deserve anything. I owe Him everything. He don't, he don't owe me anything. He's paid the price for me. But I know He's a merciful God and because of His great mercies, whatever it is I have to deal with, if it's trouble, if it's weakness, or if it's blindness, I'll just look to Him. And I said, God, have mercy on me. Remember a story, true story. My uncle, I heard him tell it. I've shared it. Some of you hadn't heard it, but I've shared it before. He was a farmer, and he had one of them old-fashioned corn pickers, you know, only one row corn pickers had those little augers that turned. His name was Wilmer Rowland. Him and his wife, ain't Ida, and another ain't of mine's only Pentecostals in our family. But I remember hearing the story, and I, and he, but he, anyway, he got his corn picker was having trouble. Got a lot of them old vines in it, and so he got off the tractor, and it was still a running, and he was trying to pull some of that stuff out, and he trying to pull one of them vines loose, and he bounced back into the tractor, and he, when he went back, his hand got caught in that little auger, and uh, he pulled four of his fingers off in there. His hand, if you've seen him, he had a nub. It looked worse than that crooked thumb. I'm just being thankful I got a crooked thumb, all right? So I ain't worried about that. I can use it good. Uh, but anyway, he, he bounced back, and he got his hand called in there, and he, when he pulled back, and, and then it throwed him back in, and it got his leg. And it was up there above his knee, and it was standing up there, that tractor just, a, just a rolling. And he was thinking, what am I going to do? I'm back here in the backfield. Ain't nobody around. And this thing is about to get me. He said, all I knew to do was look up. And I said, Lord, have mercy. And he said, God shut that tractor off just like that. He didn't turn the switch key. He didn't have to. But he shut that tractor off. And he said, I experienced the mercy of God that day. He said, I was still standing in there with that knee hung in that auger. And he said... He's a little bit prideful. He, he said, I hate to holler, but that was the only way I could get anybody to hear me. So I hollered help, and one of his sisters heard him and went back there in the field, and they went back and called out old Hamlets, and they got in there and had to cut him out with a blowtorch. Dr. Richardson wanted to take that leg off there above the knee, and he wouldn't let him. He said, no, I don't want you to do that. He said, well, I can't fix it. He said, I don't want to do what you can. <laughs> he said, I don't want you to take my leg off. I already got these fingers missing. He said, I'll do what I can. He said, well, you ain't going to never walk. He said, well, just do what you can. And he did what he could, but the Lord had mercy. He walked on that leg without crutches. And without a walking stick. And he was walking till he died. He died with something else. But God had mercy. What I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, is God is a merciful God. And we cry out to Him. We have every right uh, to cry out to Him. Not only for ourselves, but also for our children and for those around us. Uh, there's a story in, uh, in Matthew uh, chapter number 15. Talk about the woman from Canaan out there. She, she cried unto the Lord. She said, have mercy on me. But it wasn't for her personally. He also called him the son of David. But her daughter was vexed. It was demon possessed. And there wasn't nothing she could do about it. But she asked the Lord to have mercy on her. And she began to describe how, how it was going on. And she was even discouraged by some of the Lord's followers that day some of his close associates, his disciples. And they told her to hush. Ladies and gentlemen, this world wants you to hush up about it. But you and I need to tell it all the more. We need to cry out all the more. I think sometimes our prayer meetings has gotten too quiet. We're just not as desperate or either we don't believe 
that God's a merciful God and He can do what He always could do. And He'll do it for the reason that He always did. He's a merciful God. But she wouldn't leave and she wouldn't hush. And the Lord had mercy on her that day, challenged her faith by helping her to know that that she wasn't in. She wasn't one of His at that time. She was a Gentile, and she was outside the covenant. And you know the story, some of you do. But He challenged her that day, but, and uh, they were referred to as dogs, Gentile dogs, outside the covenant, or lived outside the house, so to speak. And now some of you have inside dogs. That's no reflection on you if that's where you want them to be. But don't know how that fit in there. Probably didn't. But anyway, we'll move on. But she said, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And she said, great is thy faith. And from that hour, God delivered this woman's daughter. Now some of you know some people, if they ain't full of the devil, they act like they are. It's okay to pray for and talk to the Lord and ask God for His mercy that God will set them free. You don't necessarily have to be there every time. Sometimes I think we want to be there so we can pat ourselves on the back and say, look what I did, instead of giving God all the glory. But to Him be the glory, for His mercy endureth forever. I'm going to clip Warren Bartimaeus. I'm going to move on. There's a scripture that somewhat I think people don't understand. We don't always get what we ask for. That's a tough one, isn't it? It's tough for a lot of folk. But there's a scripture in Romans 9, verse 15, that goes something like this. The Lord will have mercy on whom? He said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Now, he said that to Moses back when he was going through the deliverance of the children of Israel. And he said, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God's sovereign, and he can do it. He can do it any, any way he wants to go with it. He's God, and we're not. But I just believe that I can, if it's for me not asking, I ain't going to be the reason I ain't getting it. I can tell you that. God says you receive not because you ask not. And there are times I believe that that's the case, biblically speaking, because the Bible says so. Matter of fact, we talked recently about the story of Nineveh, how God had already pronounced judgment on a city. And the, and the prophet that he was sending, I didn't want to go to begin with. And I don't believe his message or his positive uh, as you would probably evaluate mine to be this morning. He, he just went there, and sometimes, you know, it may sound that way, but God has a reason for what He does when He does it. But there was a people that believed, and they knew something about God, or else they would have not done what they did. The problem was they were doing nothing about it. It's not that the world don't know there's a God out there. Some of them trying to figure out who he is and they go in the wrong direction with it and they're trying to make up one of their own. But a lot of them believe there's a God out there, but they just don't know who he is and they're not paying him any mind if there was a, a one true God, and there is. But that's what the city of Nineveh was doing. But when they heard the word of God, they believed the word of God and they believed that there was a God and he was going to do what the prophet Jonah said he was going to do. He's going he's to deal with us according to our sin. And so they fasted and prayed for three days, and, uh, and God had mercy on them. And this was uh, their uh, question. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from His fierce anger that we perish not? Who can tell? We might just get mercy. Aren't you glad God doesn't always deal with us according to our own ways? God has mercy. Now, I know there's times uh, we experience this chastisement, but God's merciful. And He was merciful 
uh, to a group of people. There's another story that's a little bit different than that one. It's the story of David. David was a, was a great king. I heard a message recently by R.C. Sproul about, uh, he compared David to Alexander the Great, and a lot of folks know about Alexander the Great, but they don't know about David the Great. He's not called that, but, but he was a great general. And he was a mighty man, and God used him powerfully uh, as, a young, as a young man. And uh, he went into battle, and killed a giant, just to make the story go quickly. He killed a giant, and Saul took him in, took him home with him, and said, I'd like to have you close by. You Not only are you a good warrior, but you play music good, and I like to hear the music. It kind of soothes me when, I, when I'm bad. But God anointed David king uh, over Israel, and eventually, as a result of all backsliding, God anointed David king of Israel, sent the prophet over to his house, and to anoint him. Sometime God uh, tells people to tell people things that they really would wish that somebody else would tell them. You don't want to have to go there. And Nathan the prophet was one of those uh, people. God said, go anoint David. He said, what, what if Saul kills me? Saul going to kill me if I go anoint David king. He said, you just go do what I tell you to do. So sometimes God asks us to do things that are, are difficult and unpleasant, but we have to do it anyway. Well, David eventually became king. Uh, he killed a giant, he killed a bear, and he killed a lion. But there was one day he was, uh, after he became king, that he got involved in a relationship with Bathsheba. And uh, she got pregnant with a child, and he was trying to figure out how he was going to get out of that. And uh, seeing as how he was king, he, he called uh, uh, Uriah uh, home and said, I'll just call him home, let him go home to his wife, and everybody will think it's his. That's the world's way of dealing with stuff. And David, for a period of time, he was referred to, and I want you to listen to this, he was referred to as a man after God's own heart before this time. But during this particular season in his life, he wasn't living like that. And he got in trouble. And when Uriah... was sent home, he didn't go home. He slept outside the king's castle. And he said, well, i got to hide this. So he called Joab. The general told him to take Uriah, put him on the front lines of battle, and when you get him out there in the heat of the battle, the rest of you back up. Don't sound like a man of God. Don't sound like a man after God's own heart. And in this particular time of his life, he wasn't a man after God's own heart. He was a man trying to cover his own sin. And it went from one thing to another. Now this is what happens when you and I don't, just don't do straight up and deal with our sin. We try to cover it up. We try to hide it. It just gets worse and worse. Well, God sent the prophet that went to anoint David king, sent him back to David with another message. He didn't want to have to tell him what God told him to tell him. But God told him, uh, to tell him a parable about the rich man and the poor man. The rich man had about anything he wanted, and the poor man only had one little sheep. And so he told him that story. David listened to it and said he, he didn't kill one of his own sheep. He took one of his, the, the, from the poor man. And David got angry. And it's amazing how you and I, we can get angry about other people's sin, but we kind of want to polish ours over. We want God to be merciful to us. But David said, the man that done this thing shall surely die. And Nathan says, you the man. And God's Spirit touched David's heart. And he said, I've sinned. Nathan told him, your sins are covered, but the consequences are great for what you're going to have to deal with. That child that's conceived is going to die, and there's going to be trouble in your house the rest of your days. That's a tough pill to swallow, ladies and gentlemen. 
But that's what God told him. Some people don't think God does things like that in the morning. Well, you'll have to talk to him about that. He's God. He'll do what he wants to, whether we like it or not. But David, his child got sick. It was born. got sick. And David fasted. Didn't eat for seven days. They'd come try to get him up to eat something he wouldn't eat. And eventually the child died. David got up, washed himself, changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. He said, I can't go be with him. I mean, he can't come to me, but I'll go to him. There's times that don't always work out like we want it to. But God is still God, and He's still a merciful God because He is a God of mercy. I'd, we'd love to just tell everybody that everything's just going to work out. It is going to work out. But there's times we don't always get what we ask for. And there's times we do. And for those times we do, I'm going to go that route. I'm going to go that route. If he says no to me, I hope I can deal with it. And he has a few times. And it probably won't be the last. But he said no to some other people in the Bible. So I won't feel left out if he does. He said no to Paul. About a thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times about it. And Lord, he didn't say that. I'm paraphrasing. He said, I don't want to hear about that no more. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And however that worked out, it worked out. We don't know what that was. A lot of uh, ideas, but nobody knows for sure. And then Jesus, when he was almost to the point he was going to the cross, he felt the pressure, just like you and I would feel it. And he said, Lord, if you'd be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Some people think that's praying in unbelief. But folks, we don't always get what we ask for. But we submit to the will of God, whatever that is. We know He's merciful. In Acts 13... Verse 34. They were referring back to an Old Testament passage of Scripture about Christ and God raising Him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. And He said on this wise, He says, I will give the sure mercies of David. I want to explain that. Even though you don't get what you want now, there is a sure mercies of David. We may die. That's a possibility for every one of us in this room. We may die today. We may die tomorrow. There's people I talk with all the time. I say all the time. I mean, that's a general term. But all along the way where people face death. I'd love to tell every one of them they're not going to die. They're going to live. I actually thought Miss Carol was going to have some more days and went up there and listened to her and I about figured out, well, maybe I was wrong. And I accused her of pulling rank on me. But you know God gave her more days anyway. So sometimes, you know, we look at our surroundings and we have a tendency sometimes to even doubt what we feel like the Lord's laid upon our hearts. But there is a sure mercies of David. When it's all said and done, you can't lose if you go with God. No matter what happens, you can't lose if you go with God. There is a sure mercies of David. We know to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. We know He's going to fix it all when God's got a fix for everything. It ain't always fixed in this life. But He's got a fix for everything. And He'll take us 
And he'll make sure. That's the sure mercies of David. When we get to the end of the way, when it's all said and done, we'll rest our case in our Lord Jesus Christ and we'll know that he'll take us to be with him no matter what. He'll be there. He'll always be for us. In Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, he said, It's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Every day we wake up with a new possibility, but God might just show us mercy today because His compassions never fail. In Hebrews 4, verse 16, a scripture we're very familiar with. We're instructed therefore to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's merciful today and His grace is sufficient. In Titus 3, 5, it's not by works. It's not because you and I go to God and say, Okay, God, I deserve it. I've been living for you all this time. I've done all these wonderful things. And God says, I don't even want to hear that. But he said, It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. And we'll close with this one. Some of you might be there where the old publican was in Luke 18, verse 13. Sometimes we get real religious and thinking, you know, well, I deserve this, I deserve that. We deserve nothing. We deserve judgment. But because of the mercies of God, He sent Jesus Christ to take our punishment, and we will experience the sure mercies of David in the end when we stand before God on judgment day. But we've been instructed to come boldly to the throne of grace. And this publican came and following a prayer session that one of the Pharisees had about telling God how good he was. Don't you know God was really pleased with that? When he looks down and he sees that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, he has a man telling him how good he is. When he already said, and when he was approached with that term, he said, there's none good but God. This is why we need His mercies. And if you ever look square in the face of God and experience His presence, you'll have a realization of that, no matter what your theology is. You'll have a realization of that. But it's because of His mercies. But this publican wouldn't even get close to him. But he stood afar off and he smote himself on the breast. And he says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I feel like there's somebody in this church that needs to pray that prayer today. There may be other prayers of mercy, and there are. But this is one of the most important ones we'll ever pray. Prayer of confession that I've sinned and come short of the glory of God. God already said that so. It's just a matter of you and I agreeing with Him. Romans 3.23 But yet we've been invited to come boldly, not presumptuously, not arrogantly, but boldly to the throne room and ask for His mercy. And God says, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. So if you're here today, I'm going to give you opportunity just the next moment or two. I'm going to ask if you will, just to, let's just take a moment and pray. And, but if you're here and you say, Brother Bill, I need to pray that prayer. I want to invite you to the altar. The altar is a place of submission. It's symbolic. I realize you can do it right where you're seated. And if the Lord wills and you live, you can do it tomorrow. 
but we have no promise of tomorrow. But if you're here and you say, I need the mercies of God, or God's put somebody strong upon your heart, it may be a loved one or it may be some acquaintance that you would like to pray for and pray with all the faith that God's given you that God will have mercy. I'll invite you to come. And let's do that. If there's some in this building that somebody's heavy on your heart or you have a personal need, if you would come down with us today and, and look to God and just ask Him for His great mercy. God wants to be merciful, I believe. I believe He's put this message on my heart today to, because of some circumstances that, that we've encountered in life. I think as a result of that, He wants us to call on Him. Perhaps He may give us mercy as we have asked Him to do this morning. If there are others, please come. It's by His great mercies. that we experience the blessings of God and the grace of God. Don't count God out, no matter what your circumstances are. Let's believe Him together this morning as we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your great name. Sometimes we need mercy because of personal things. But we do need mercy from God. So I want us to pray you in the congregation. If you don't sense the need to come forward, if you'll just pray for these. Just if right on your heart, just pray for these that are here. We may be the next ones that need to bow before a holy God. Call on him and cry out, Oh God, have mercy. Upon me. Have mercy upon my child that's being led astray by the powers of darkness. Have mercy, O oh God. Let's don't give up believing God, ladies and gentlemen. Let's continue to believe together for the grace and mercy of God.